He represented the pride of the Canadian military. However, the colonel was also a panty-stealing criminal whose sensual obsessions sent him into a spiral that resulted in several assaults and two killings. The life of Colonel David Russell Williams was admirable. He was being prepared for higher positions and was a well-liked leader in the Canadian military. He and his wife had been married for a long time and owned two homes in areas where they were a part of welcoming, secure communities. The couple enjoyed playing golf, according to his official military biography, which also mentioned that he liked fishing, running, and, most notably, photography. However, something went awry. This former Canadian military hero became an offender. Along with the meticulousness that made him such a skilled leader, his passion for photography would not only encourage his bad behavior but also supply the proof that would bring him to justice. The mild-mannered colonel suddenly displayed a wave of perversion and violence in Ottawa and the eastern Ontario communities of Belleville, Brighton, and Tweed over the course of two years. He started by invading neighbors' homes and taking pictures of himself wearing women's and girls' undergarments. He then r-worded two women before killing two victims. He also kept meticulous records throughout, including pictures, films, and notes, which helped in his trial and helped him gain notoriety as one of North America's sickest offenders. Nothing in Colonel Russell Williams' past suggested that he would be a predator. The only blemish on his wealthy upbringing and youth was his parents' separation, and he went on to have an incredibly successful military career. He was born in the English Midlands city of Bromsgrove in 1963, but his family quickly relocated to Deep River, Ontario. Deep River, a small town in the southeast of the large province, was established as a planned community by the Canadian government for employees at the close-by Chalk River Nuclear Research Laboratory, where Cedric David Williams, Williams' father, was a metallurgist. Wealthy, educated professionals in the town perceived themselves as distinct from provincial rural residents who lived outside the boundaries of the planned community. The residents of Deep River created a close-knit community and frequently took advantage of the meticulously planned social opportunities offered by the town. The Williams family joined the Deep River Yacht and Tennis Club, just like the majority of their neighbors. Cedric David Williams and Christine Nanai Williams, however, divorced in 1970. Christine wed Jerry Savka again quite fast. Savka, a Canadian-born son of Czech immigrants, first met Christine Williams while studying at the University of Birmingham in England. Savka, a nuclear engineer, began working for Ontario Hydro not long after Christine and he were married. Savka moved to Toronto with his new wife, stepsons Russell and Harvey, and all of them into a lovely home that overlooked Lake Ontario from the Scarborough Bluffs. Russell learned the trumpet and the keyboard in Toronto, where he also fell in love with jazz. He delivered the Globe and Mail for a living. The newspaper would subsequently detail his trial. The family was moved once more by Jerry Sofka's profession in 1979, this time to South Korea. However, Russ Sofka, as he was then known, stayed behind to complete high school. He transferred to Upper Canada College, a prestigious residential institution, from Toronto's Birchmount Collegiate. He adapted easily and kept doing well. In his last year, 1982, his fellow students chose him to be one of the two prefects of their boarding house. The bright and cunning young guy was once locked in his room by his peers as a practical joke, but he managed to get free by tying his bedclothes together and climbing out the window. He continued his education at the University of Toronto Scarborough, where he received a degree in economics and politics. At Toronto's Buttonville Airport, he acquired his pilot's license while still in college. He went a while without dating after his breakup with his fiancée shortly after graduating and revealed his intention to join the military as a pilot. David Russell Williams had renounced the name Sofka by the time he joined the military in 1987 and had adopted his real name. He had his first military duty as a flying instructor with the CT-134 Musketeers at Portage La Prairie, on the Manitoba Prairie just west of Winnipeg. Williams was an intense young man who was full of potential, according to Major Greg McQuaid. In 1992, Williams was promoted from lieutenant to captain with the assistance of McQuaid, and he was assigned to Canadian Forces Base Shearwater in Nova Scotia. In 1991, Williams wed Mary Elizabeth Harriman. She was raised in the mining community of Madsen in northwest Ontario, where her father was a geologist. She graduated from the University of Guelph with an applied science degree after attending Red Lake High School and she later went on to get a master's degree in adult education from St. Francis Xavier University in Nova Scotia. Williams graduated with a master's in defense studies from the Royal Military College in 2003. His 55-page thesis backed an attack on Iraq as a preventative measure. He had been promoted to major in 1999, and in 2004, he was chosen to command the NO. 437 Transport Squadron at Canadian Forces Base Trenton. His military career continued to flourish. 
He flew dignitaries from Canada and beyond on the Bombardier Challenger fleet of the Canadian Armed Forces. Williams deployed in Camp Mirage in Dubai for six months each in 2005 and 2006. This covert station offers logistical support for Canadian operations in Afghanistan. Williams also experienced a personal setback as a result of his mother's divorce from Jerry Sofka in 2001, which caused a rift between the family. Williams severed all ties with his mother and Harvey, his younger sibling. Sofka moved to aix en provence France. Nanai Williams was a physiotherapist in Toronto, and Harvey had graduated from medical school and practiced medicine in Ontario. Williams kept his distance from each of them. Williams had a demanding career. Williams was appointed commanding officer of the largest Air Force base in Canada, Canadian Forces Base Trenton, in 2009. Government officials are served by a fleet of planes at CFB Trenton, which also serves as a rapid deployment force hub and a search and rescue facility. Williams and Mary Elizabeth Harriman subsequently sold the home they had purchased in 1996 in Ottawa's Ormans area and invested the proceeds in a brand new townhouse in the hip Westboro Village neighborhood. They would alternate between living in the townhouse and a vacation residence they owned outside of Tweed, which was much nearer to Williams' command. In 2004, they purchased the lakefront vacation property on Cozy Cove Lane. The colonel made a name for himself as a respected community member and neighbor in Tweed and Trenton. He appeared at charitable events, posed for pictures with the media, and consistently assisted those under his charge. His wife joined the Heart and Stroke Foundation, a Canadian nonprofit, as an assistant director. Williams stayed alone in the cottage in Tweed during the week but spent his weekends with her in Ottawa. The colonel seemed to have had lots of free time as a result of this arrangement. However, detectives are convinced that Colonel David Russell Williams' crimes didn't start until he was 44, when he started breaking into neighbors' homes. Experts tell us that most offenders start their habits young and win down in their 42nd. In September 2007, Ron and Monique Murdoch of Cozy Cove Lane were visiting Monique's ailing mother in neighboring Sudbury with their children. Williams went into the 12-year-old daughter's room after walking into the unlocked, unoccupied Tweed residence. The colonel stayed there for three hours while taking pictures of himself and donning various pairs of the girl's underwear. He took six of her bras and undies with him when he departed. Over the following few years, he would return to this girl's room twice more and break into the houses of 47 other neighbors, returning to one of them nine times, during his jogs to preserve his military body. He observed the residences and their female residents. There doesn't appear to have been any inkling that the colonel was releasing a dark side. Williams continued to have beer and play cards with the Murdochs. He kept on speaking French with Monique. He learned cribbage from their daughter, who also made cookies and cupcakes for him and his wife, watched their new cat Rosebud, and even wrote a school essay about him. Williams took the girl's brother and then Lake Tubing. Some Williams' neighbors now claim that 2007 was a difficult year for Williams. He broke down in tears when informing friends about the loss of his old cat, Curio. He then started to struggle with persistent pain. He began taking a variety of medications for his pains. Manic behavior as well as bipolar disorder and psychotic illnesses have been linked to the medication prednisone, which is used to treat a number of inflammatory and autoimmune conditions. Williams was allegedly taking potent drugs that altered his behavior, according to a writer who claimed to be a former co-worker in an anonymous letter to the Toronto Star. This was confirmed to the Star by a second anonymous source, who specified the medicine as prednisone. Williams had been taking prednisone since arriving home from Dubai, and Monique Murdoch, the colonel's next-door neighbor, has also confirmed that the pain or the drugs used to treat it contributed to the colonel's insomnia. Systemic corticosteroids like prednisone are not suitable for use during flight operations, according to Canadian Air Force flight surgeon standards. A military doctor would have overseen Williams' medical care. However, no one at the time seemed to have been alarmed by the colonel's actions. In this little village, people frequently left their doors unlocked and never noticed anything was wrong. They might not have known there was a dangerous pervert next door if it weren't for his more serious later crimes and the detailed record Williams maintained of his offenses. However, he intensified his criminal activity and attacked two ladies in September 2009. On September 16, 2009, Colonel David Russell Williams returned to Tweed following a regular visit to a Canadian Forces base in Nunavut. He broke into a cabin on Charles Road just after midnight, not far from the lakefront home he and his wife occupied. He entered the home while concealed. There was a woman alone, watching a Law & Order episode. He used his flashlight to try to put her to sleep, but she was still awake. She was then bound by wire and given a blindfold. Williams attacked her but assured her that he wouldn't RP her and that all he wanted was pictures of her naked body. He also took a shot of himself while covering his face with her panties and donning a black ski helmet. 
The woman has only recently relocated to Tweed. She had desired to bring up her child in a tiny town's security. Throughout the attack, the infant was in the room next door. A few hours later, Williams went to a CIO conference in the Ramada Inn in Belleville, which is south of Tweed. Williams accepted the donation to Soldier On, an organization that helps injured soldiers, on behalf of his base. A couple of days later, he would drop the puck at the Belleville Bulls junior-level ice hockey team's season opener before going to his base's Battle of Britain Memorial March. Two weeks later, he struck once more. His victim was only a couple of doors away. On September 30th, a masked intruder woke her up and forced her to strip off her clothing, tie her to a chair, and abuse her while snapping pictures. The woman mistook her assailant for a different neighbor, Larry Jones. The colonel went to a ceremony two days later to give his wife's organization a check. Assorted underwear, bras, and a baby blanket were among the items that police searched Larry Jones' home for during their hunt for the two women who had been attacked. When Larry Jones arrived home from a trip, police were waiting for him in his driveway. They seized his cameras, computers, and hunting gear, but there was no evidence that would have implicated him. Jones provided DNA and a polygraph evidence, and he was exonerated. Williams, though, remained free and became more and more uncontrollable. Colonel David Russell Williams broke into a different house close to Belleville on November 17, 2009. He also stole a toy, a pornographic video, and numerous items of underwear. On the resident's personal computer, he left a mocking note in which he dared her to call the police and remarked that the judge would like to see her dildo. The snapshot Williams took of that message and a picture of the woman's cat were among the artifacts that investigators would later discover from this attack. But what he would do after that was much worse. Williams flew at least once every month to maintain his pilot license, typically in an Airbus A310 from the No. 437 Squadron, which he had previously commanded. On many of these trips, flight attendant Marie France Camo, 38, was employed. Camo was raised in a military household. Her grandpa had been a Spitfire pilot who had received awards during World War II, and her father was a medic in the Canadian Armed Forces. She gladly and competently followed in their footsteps, proudly working on the trip to Mumbai in November 2009 carrying Prime Minister Stephen Harper. After returning from India, she missed a shift, so her boyfriend went to her Brighton home on Raglan Street to find her. He discovered her dead. Williams broke in while wearing a mask and crouched behind Camo's furnace to wait for her to go to sleep. But when she went downstairs to look for her cat, he opened fire. By using a flashlight, he beat her. He later fastened her to a pole. Along with his criminal goals, he also had artistic ones. So he brought in some lighting to better record himself while he repeatedly R-worded the woman. Camo once inquired as to whether he intended to murder her. For her life, she implored. He used duct tape to bind her lips and nose almost drowning her. He then carried her unconscious body upstairs to her bed where he R-worded her. Camo almost managed to escape when he came to when he stepped outside to make sure they were alone. When he found her in the restroom, he beat her once more while using the flashlight. Williams appears to have slain her in silence before making the three-hour trip to a meeting. While removing the tape and restraints, he left a shoe print in her blood. Williams was there at a United Way fundraiser on November 25th when her boyfriend discovered Camo's body. In jest, his co-workers threatened to put him in prison and accused him of being too young to be a wing commander there. Williams cheerfully posed in handcuffs, but insisted he was too busy to do the entire fundraising charade to go into the cage. On December 4, 2009, Camo was laid to rest at the National Military Cemetery in Ottawa. Williams, who was in charge of her base, sent her father an official letter of sympathy. Between Belleville and Tweed, on rural Highway 37, Jessica Lloyd, 27, lived alone. She was an administrator of a school bus line at Triboard Student Transportation Services on January 29, 2010. However, she failed to arrive for work. Her family was immediately summoned to her home by co-workers. In the driveway next to her car, Lloyd's pocketbook with her wallet, ID, and glasses was lying, but she wasn't there. Her body wasn't discovered by the police until February 8, when Colonel David Russell Williams first saw her in late January. He was out for one of his meticulous runs. She was working out in her basement on a treadmill. Williams entered when she was sleeping a few nights later. He assaulted her while taking pictures and videos, binding her and covering her eyes with duct tape. This was part of what was becoming his habit. After R-wording her at her house, he drove her to his cottage on Cozy Cove Lane where he assaulted her once more. He made her take a shower in his presence. She begged him for clothing and begged him to take her to the hospital while she shivered in the shower. She forewarned him that she would pass away. He told her, hang in there, sweetie, remain patient. She gave in to everything he asked, alternately pleading with him to save her life and begging him to tell her mother that she loved her. 
He dressed her like a model for his photographs and fed her fruit to keep her going. He then killed her by strangling her after hitting her from behind with a flashlight. After moving her dead body to his garage, he dumped it a little distance from his property on a country road. Williams oversaw a troop trip to California later that morning. He must have believed he was getting away with it again. In an effort to discover Jessica Lloyd's kidnapper or murderer, police closed key highways around Belleville. On February 4, 2010, Colonel David Russell Williams was one of those detained. An officer at the roadblock noted that Williams' Pathfinder SUV's tires matched the peculiar marks that authorities believed were left by an SUV that a bystander had seen the day Lloyd vanished, parked oddly in the midst of a field close to Lloyd's house. Williams' townhouse in Ottawa heard a call on Sunday, February 7. He was summoned to the Ottawa Police Service headquarters by the Ontario Provincial Police so they could question him. He smiled at his interrogator upon arrival and declared he had never been in a room like this. Williams confessed after being informed about the identical tire treads and the growing body of evidence connecting him to the other crimes. Then he spent almost 10 hours detailing his bizarre and ultimately murderous criminal objectives to Inspector Jim Smythe, a behavioral science expert with the Ontario Provincial Police. Williams spent the majority of his 10-hour confession standing which is consistent with Monique Murdoch's recollections of how Williams' severe discomfort made it impossible for him to sit through their card games. Inspector Smythe was unable to fully understand the colonel's intentions. I don't know the answers, and I'm pretty sure the answers don't matter, was all he could manage to say. But he could explain his motivation for confessing, to make life simpler for his wife. He wrote her a note of apology and a request to take excellent care of their cat, Rosebud, at the end of his signed confession. Investigators located Jessica Lloyd's body close to Williams' Tweed Cottage as he had promised. She had been alive in the cottage for at least 15 hours before being strangled, they found. When investigators examined the cottage, his house, and Ottawa, they found a plethora of mementos that supported Williams' story of the attacks, including notes, photos, and souvenirs. He twice set fire to his collection of intimates in a rural region outside of Ottawa. But there was still plenty of evidence to implicate him, such as pictures of a room shared by twin 11-year-old girls and 87 pairs of underwear from one underage girl. Within 24 hours after William's arrest, the prosecution's case against him was almost finished. No relation to the colonel. Mayor John R. Williams began learning about the crimes from his constituents in April 2010. Some of them had heard rumors that, before the scandal surfaced, they had been ignorant of the fact that David Russell Williams had admitted to breaking into their homes. Colonel Williams was placed on suicide watch after attempting to kill himself in his cell by shoving cardboard down his neck. Colonel David Russell Williams entered a guilty plea to two murders, two additional RPs, and 82 burglaries on October 18, 2010, during his Belleville trial. Many of the photographs Williams had taken of his tormented subjects and of himself in their underwear, visibly aroused, were presented as evidence by the prosecution. In some, he wore cotton underwear covered in cartoon characters, while in others, close-ups of his erection were shown as he posed in silk underwear. Instead of displaying the contents of his collection of videotaped acts, the prosecution only described them. Several of the images were printed by the media. Colonel Williams was given two life sentences for murder on October 21, 2010, and an additional 120 years for the other charges by Justice Robert F. Scott. Williams' SUV, along with all of his meticulously kept records of his crimes and the hundreds of items of clothing he had stolen, were to be destroyed, the judge ruled. Williams also had to pay a fine of $8,800 to a fund for crime victims, according to the judge. A lot of Canadians demanded the death penalty, which had been abolished in their nation in 1976, as Williams' crimes were made public by the media. At a maximum security facility in Kingston, Ontario, Williams is currently housed in segregation. At the age of 72, he will be eligible for parole in 2035. Williams' commission was revoked by the Canadian Armed Forces. His decorations and clothes were ceremonially burnt by four military authorities. The first Canadian officer to experience such humiliation was him. However, nothing in Canadian law prevents him from receiving a pension. Mary Elizabeth Harriman, his wife, was not present at the trial, but she continues to be affected by her husband's actions. Harriman is currently dealing with a lawsuit in addition to learning that her husband of almost 20 years stole women's underwear, killed two women, and R-worded two more. A $2.45 million lawsuit has been brought against the couple by one of Williams' surviving victims. The woman claims that Harriman and Williams engaged in fraudulent asset transfers to protect their money from potential legal claims, in addition to wanting to hold Williams accountable for his crimes and the mental suffering they caused her. Shortly after Williams' arrest, 
Williams and Harriman split their property. The cheap Tweed cottage became Williams, while Harriman allegedly paid him $62,000 for his share of their pricier townhouse. The civil suit remains unresolved, but Colonel David Russell Williams will spend at least the next 25 years in jail for what he's acknowledged are despicable crimes. 